Okay, hi everyone. Um, so today I'm going to present two open source projects that I've been working on for the for the last while, um, which together form a an operational near real time lake monitoring uh, system at a, a national scale, um, where we've currently deployed it for for Switzerland. So lakes are super important in, in Switzerland. They're heavily used um, from everything from swimming to, to drinking water. Uh, and it's vital to understand water quality and their conditions uh, for, for managing them for, for these activities. So the two projects that I'm gonna talk about are Sencast and, and Data Lakes. Sendcast is a, a Python toolbox for downloading Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 images uh, and computing water quality parameters from, from these images. The second project is, is Data Lakes, and this is a, an open data platform for accessing, visualizing, and comparing heterogeneous environmental data sets uh, online. And as I said before, these, these two projects together form an operational pipeline that facilitates easy access um, to environmental observation data and allows you to compare and contrast various different heterogeneous environmental data sets. So for the study of lakes, we have three main data sets that we can call on. Um, the first one is remote sensing. So here we can derive water quality parameters from, from spectral information. Um, this has the benefits of large spatial coverage. We get regular data. However, the resolution is often limited. It's impacted by cloud cover, and we only really get information about the, the upper layers of the lake. Um, second data source that we can call on is in situ measurements. So this is where we physically go to site, uh, use instruments to to take data about the, the water. Um, so this is very accurate. Um, we get the full water column uh, and we can record many, many different parameters, but there's a limited spatial coverage. It's normally only a point sample in one point in the lake. The third main data source is hydrodynamic models. <clears throat> so here we use weather data to simulate the state of the lake this means we get full depth and spatial coverage. Um, however, this comes with resolution constraints just based on computing capacity. The accuracy is fairly limited and we normally are only simulating a couple of parameters, often just velocity and, and temperature. So with these three streams of data, we wanted a way to be able to compare each of them easily without having to download each data set and then spend hours and hours plotting data. So we developed the platform Data Lakes. So the key goals for the Data Lakes project were reproducibility. So for the in-situ data in particular, we integrated the pipeline with, with Git such that everything is completely reproducible. Uh, we have a large emphasis on visualization. Um, this allows people to, to preview the data sets before they commit to downloading. Uh, and lets a lot of people do a lot of stuff online rather than having to, to process offline themselves. Uh, and we developed a, a WebGIS as part of this to allow these multiple different data sets to be plotted, layered up on top of each other. Just going to give a quick schematic of the, the Data Lakes project. Um, so this is the was the original core for the in-situ data. Um, we have the data going into a Git repository and then being transform to a, a typical web architecture for, for sharing this data. And then we have the Sencast project, which brings remote sensing data into this pipeline, and the Meteor Lakes project, which brings remote uh, brings simulation data into this pipeline. But we won't be talking about uh, Meteor Lakes today. Just going to go into a, a little bit more detail into to how the in-situ data, data pipeline works. So we get in-situ data from all across Switzerland, um, from a variety of, of buoys, platforms, and people just going out on boats to take samples. Um, the data is then processed locally. Um, this processing normally involves 
transforming the data into desired units, some quality assurance to ensure that the, the data we're publishing is, is reasonable, um, potentially producing some higher level products. This could mean taking a number of sensors on, our, on an array and transforming this into a, into a gridded data set. We then use scientific formats to, to save the data uh, and, and upload it to GitLab. This can then easily be added to the, the data lakes uh, open data portal. Um, the user simply, there's a, there's a user interface for supplying a link to that NetCDF file in the Git repository and the data lakes API does the rest of pulling that information, passing the file um, and transforming it, transforming it into, into JSON for web use. Uh, it's also possible for these data sets to be operational. Um, we can add Git webhooks to, to the repositories, which means that every time something is updated, we get a new data in, um, we reprocess some data, those changes are automatically reflected in the, in the data portal. Uh, just going to quickly go into the, the front end. Um, so we have a typical shopping cart style um, data, data portal for filtering, searching for, for various different data sets. Um, as, as so far, we have 58 heterogeneous data sets for, uh, with more than 60 different lake parameters for 16 different lakes in Switzerland and five data sets which cover the entirety of Switzerland. So essentially at every single lake. When you go into any one of the, the data sets, um, there's a number of different options for, for accessing the data. As I said before, one of the main objectives is uh, visualization. So heat maps, line graphs, um, there's the opportunity to, to plot these parameters in many different ways. Um, you can also see the location, where the data was taken, what time, and also filter on these parameters. Instead of being forced to potentially download a massive five-year time series, there's also the ability to chunk data and just take uh, data for a, for a given time period. Reproducibility is super important for us. So all of the scripts that are used to process the data are shared through the portal. Um, and for certain data sets, there's the option to, to spawn a, a new environment and, and interact with the, the data directly. Um, but essentially, all the information that is needed to, to fully reproduce these pipelines is, is provided. Uh, some more information on the, on the data sets, but probably more interesting is the, the uh, web viewer, the map viewer, where you can add a number of different data sets at the same time and compare them. At the end of the talk, I have a, a small demo to show how this works. Um, but right now in the image, you can see a chlorophyll concentration product derived from, from Sentinel-3 imagery. Um, you have the velocity field from a hydrodynamic simulation and then a point value from, a, from real measurements that were made on the lake. And this is all at the, the same time. All of these data sets can be accessed through the, the Data Lakes API, which means any future projects that include, want to pull this data automatically, um, they, they can do so. We're not, there's no limitations on the, the access to that, to that data. As part of the, this project, we've developed a number of open source JavaScript libraries for, for visualizing this data. Um, some of them are kind of niche to, to lakes in particular. So streamlines um, is not a, a typical visualization task. However, things like heat maps um, is a common, a common task across many data. Um, and we found that existing tools weren't performant enough for the, for the large amounts of data that, that we wanted to show on the browser. Um, these are all accessible on, on NPM. So moving now on to the, the second project, which is Sencast. Um, this is the, the Python toolbox for, for processing Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 imagery. Uh, here we had a number of slightly different goals for, for the project. The first was, was automation um, to facilitate building automated pipelines that can be run in near real time uh, and produce these, these final products. 
we want it to be fast. Um, it's large amounts of data, and we want to be able to download and process these images in parallel. And we wanted the framework to be expandable. Um, we don't write many of the processes. A lot of the processes are written by, by other people or as, as Snap plugins. Um, and we wanted to make it easy as possible to continue to expand to, to new processes and facilitate new water quality products from this toolbox. Just a, a flashback to the, the architecture, and we're going to focus in on the, the SendCast part of it. So the structure of the, the Python toolbox. So there's a number of options for, for downloading the data um, through various different um, DS APIs. Um, but essentially, it boils down to providing a, a geometric area of interest and, and given time period. And then SynCast will automatically download all of the images in that period. You can also specify the particular satellite or the particular product that you're, that you're interested in as, as part of that. Then you define the, the processes that you would like to use. We have a, a mix of processes, some of which are, are Snap plugins, um, and we use Snap GPT to, to run these, these processes, and others are just directly Python, Python scripts, which are taken from, from various papers um, and implemented as, as processes in this framework. After these processes um, have calculated the water quality parameters, everything is, is typically stored in, in NetCDF. So we have a number of adapters that make accessing the data uh, more easy. The, the data lakes adapter um, is what connects it with the rest of the, the data lakes pipeline. And um, talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but we have other adapters such as um, QLRGB and QL single band, which plot PDFs of the of the remote sensing parameters, um, and also pixel extraction, extraction which allows for um, viewing pixels across a, a larger time series. So if we had two weeks of, of data, you can easily extract a pixel at a given location and, and plot the, the variation through that period. So this is the operational pipeline that we use as uh, part of the data lakes project. Um, we only select a subset of the, the processes as there is only certain water quality parameters that we're, we're interested in, in sharing with, with wider, wider stakeholders. This pipeline is, is automatically run each evening to process the, the new, we normally generally have two new Sentinel-3 images per, per day of Switzerland. Um, these new images are downloaded uh, and any images that have been reprocessed by, by ESA are updated uh, and reprocessed as part of this process. The processes then calculate the water quality parameters. The, the four parameters that we, we share publicly are turbidity, secchi depth, chlorophyll concentration, and, and primary production. And these are the, yeah, the main factors that uh, sent the stakeholders are looking for when managing the lakes in their, in their area. This is then exported to, to JSON and uploaded to an S3 bucket and a, an automatic call to the to the API goes out such that the, the pipeline can be can be updated. Um, this now has been running for about a year and a half um, and it's starting to build up a really nice idea of, of how these parameters change not just across the year but seasonally and is giving stakeholders uh, more information on on how to manage uh, manage their lakes. So next, I have a small demo of how the, the site can be interacted with and used. Um, so here, as with, with any other major data portal, you can access, look through the data sets, filter search. Um, I don't go into much detail of using that here. We, we had a little look before. The map viewer is where you can do most of the data customization. Here, we're taking an example data set of the chlorophyll concentration. Um, this is from the 6th of September, where we had a particularly big bloom on Lake Geneva. Um, and as you can see in the background, we can edit the, the color maps. You can change how, how we want to display this. For example, we can 
optimize the color map across the, the data set to get a much more detailed view of, of how those patterns uh, are changing in the lake. Um, this is like say any other web GIS, you can, you can interact with the data. But where we really start to be the, see the value is in adding other data sets. So now we're adding the simulation. This is a hydrodynamic 3D simulation of the lake from, from this time. Um, again, you can play with how you visualize this data as arrows, as flow lines. Um, it really depends on, on, on personal preference. Um, this particular combination of remote sensing data and uh, 3D simulations is really useful in starting to track how these blooms move around the lake and how, how the dynamics uh, are changing over time. Um, there's a time series for, for each of these data sets and there's, it's easy to, to move between the different time steps. Here now it's adding some of the in-situ data so we can also see point measurements and compare our exact measured values with what we're getting from the remote sensing data and see how these three different data sorts um, interact together. Uh, and then that's the, that's the end. Um, uh, any, any questions um, from, the, from the audience? audience? Uh, thank you. Uh, I just realized in the beginning there was a little technical glitch, so I forgot to add myself to the stream when I did your introduction. Um, so I will just use the opportunity to introduce you now uh, at the end of your presentation. And um, also, um, I forgot to mention that there is a, a little bit of delay between um, this platform, StreamYard, and the streaming, which is on another platform, around 10 seconds. So um, we will just use this time to uh, maybe get some more questions from the audience. But yeah, in the meantime, uh, for your introduction, uh, so uh, James is a software developer currently working at uh, Airbag after graduating from the University of Bristol with a master's degree in civil engineering. He spent three years at Arup designing water infrastructure in the south of west, in the southwest of the UK. And then he moved to Switzerland and uh, began building open source, so source uh, software for processing and sharing scientific data at Airlab. Um, so uh, while we are waiting for questions from the audience, I have one question that popped into my mind. Um, you mentioned that um, you're using data both from uh, Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3, right? Yes, so the Sencast project is capable of processing Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3, and we're currently adding Landsat data to that pro that process. The, the operational pipeline is just using Sentinel-3 data at the moment. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I wanted to ask you, um, how do you deal or how do you plan to deal with the differences in resolution and also geometry uh, different algorithms uh, for atmospheric correction. Um, uh, do, do you, did you have to deal with this problem or was it something that was the data already prepared, so to say, analysis ready? Um, so the the processes that um, we use as part of Syncast lean heavily on, on SNAP, so a, a piece of software by ESA for, for processing remote sensing data. Uh, and here it's relatively easy to, to resample the, the data to, um, to be in order to compare against different data sets. And this functionality is, is included in, in Sendcast. Okay, so I see. So you basically uh, use the resample to the lower resolution, so to say you don't uh, try to use uh, any upscaling algorithms. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are several questions um, in the chat. Really, really nice presentation, James. Um, one of them is, uh, could you be more specific on what type of numerical lake models are being used for media lakes part of the project? 
Uh, so that is using Delft 3D. Um, that, so the reason that project was a, a PhD project um, a couple of years ago now um, using Delft 3D. We're currently starting a new project to essentially replace and upgrade that with, with more lakes in Switzerland. Um, and the plan is now to use MITGCM. Um, but yeah, the, those models are, are Delft 3D. Thank you very much. Uh, another question. Um, what is the minimum amount of in situ data needed for this system? The minimum amount of in situ data? Um, I mean, essentially zero. I mean, you could just have a platform that shows the remote sensing data or just the um, simulation data. Uh, the, the in situ data is kind of key to really validating those two products. Um, and we see that bringing the three data sets together is what brings the most value because we can use the less accurate remote sensing and simulation data sets to, to understand how the entire lake is being affected and then use the in-situ data to really validate the, those, those more geospatially distributed products. Excellent. That's really that's a really interesting point. Um, I've been I've seen some other um, I guess models and and working on like water quality and it can be so challenging to get that in situ data. Um, so I know that it's that that's an interesting question around what what's the minimum I can get away with because we're not going to get a lot. So um, interesting. Um, another question from the audience um, has this. Uh, have management decisions been made based on this tool? So the, the main management decisions that it makes so far um, have tended to be in the research sphere. Um, so it's there's kind of a balance here between the, I mean, the group I I developed this, this for is, is pure research. They're interested in understanding more about the, the dynamics of the lakes. Uh, and how these water quality parameters um, change over time and what we can do to better study this. So, so this project has helped lead the direction of where that research is going for the next few years. However, the, the main kind of wider stakeholder products are still in their, their early days. Um, we're still validating exactly how, how accurate they are. So I would say in terms of the, say, the local government lake management, this would have a fairly limited impact so far. Great, thanks. Um, we have a question about uh, sharing the slides. Um, not sure how, uh, what mechanism we can use to do that, if it's uh, if it's possible. Uh, yeah, it's. it's fine to share the slides. Um, maybe I can, when the next session starts, I can post a, a link in the in the general chat of the next, next session. That would be yeah. wonderful. Thanks a lot. Um, well, I think the recordings will be available anyway, but um, um, yeah, I mean, it would be great, of course, if we, if we can provide the participants with the slides as well. So are there um, any more questions from the audience? Uh, there's another question about if uh, data lakes has been used by others for other lakes in other countries yet. So there has been some interest in expanding it to, to other countries. Um, for the moment, we, we've kept it to, to Switzerland. Um, already, the, the groups using it are spread between a number of different Swiss institutions. Um, so it's, um, I mean, you can see at the bottom of the screen here, we have EPFL, UNIL, University of Geneva, uh, AIRVAG is more in the Zurich side, um, ETH is also including this. So for the moment, we're, we're staying within Switzerland. Um, and to be, to be frank, there's a decision for someone above me on whether or not we, we push it to, to more international lakes that, or just focus it on Switzerland. 
That's great. I think that um, wraps up the questions that I see in the chat. Um, I think we still might have a few minutes if there's any lingering questions um, that folks want to pop in the chat or the question box. Okay, well, uh, then uh, in this case, uh, well, thank you, James. Um, I will just uh, prepare for the next speaker and um, we'll see if there are some more questions. We have this delay of 10 seconds, so we can always do that. Thank you. 